So in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'll begin in verse number 14. And those of you sharing with us on television, I'm always grateful for you sharing with us. And we're doing so many things here at your earliest convenience. I hope you'll come and share Christ with us, either at 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. services. The 14th verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 reads, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And the church said, Amen. I want you to look at your neighbors and say, neighbor, don't ever forget who you are. One more time. Don't ever forget who you are. Uh, the saints at Corinth are a real testimony to the fact that God can save anybody. Corinth was located in modern day Greece. In Paul's day, it was the center of commerce, a trade, and also immoral living. Their moral life was so low, they were low even among the people who didn't worship God. You know you're low when you're lower than the people who don't even believe God exists. Even their worship was ungodly. They literally had in their worship of the Greek goddess of love uh, and beauty and pleasure, Aphrodite. They had temple priests, females, who were actually prostitutes and then would come out from the temple and come down and ply their trade. Now, there's a whole new spin to evangelists. To be Corinthianized was the equivalent of us using the N-word today. So when you told somebody they were Corinthianized, you almost had a fight on your hands because it was meant to be an insult. It was meant to say that you represented the, the most gross immorality and drunkenness and licentious living. Yet God sent the Apostle Paul, who converted Aquila and Priscilla, and through them, the church at Corinth was founded. That's just history. You see, God saves, and I need some witnesses to understand on my voice and on television. God saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. Amen. Hallelujah. Note what the Bible says in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, hallelujah, the sanctified folks, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people everywhere with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These people have become new creations in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible says, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Yes, all things are new. But any saint will tell you, the old nature ain't far behind. Matter of fact, 
the more mature you are as a believer, the more aware you are that you have a sinful nature. You see, people who are self-righteous see themselves always in comparison to other people, and it always makes them look good. So whether they lie, whether they curse, whether they commit adultery, they can always find somebody worse than them. But mature believers don't compare themselves to other people. Mature believers compare themselves to the holiness of God. And when you compare yourself to the holiness of God, you always come up short. You, all, you begin to see that this old nature ain't gone nowhere. Someone said it went lock, stock, and barrel. Not far. And we at Saints must always be on our guard against it because it can show itself anytime, any place, anywhere. The most serious problem in the church at Corinth is the same one that we have today. Saints were not detaching themselves from the worldly ways of the society around. It, it is amazing. When you get saved, you feel so good. You feel so pure. At least I'm speaking for myself. When God gave me the Holy Spirit, I felt all the sins of my 27 years of, on earth had been forgiven. I felt like I could float on air. I felt light. Did anybody got a testimony like that? I, you know, there's a cleansing on the inside that only God can do. And when God did that, I felt really, really great, but it wasn't long. For I realized I wasn't as holy as I thought I was. Good-looking women were still fine. <laughs> Cars still looked good, still wanted this, still wanted that. You see, the problem here at Corinth is the problem we have. Yes, they wanted to go to heaven, but they wanted to live for the world also. Yes, they wanted to please Christ, but they also wanted to please the flesh. Yes, they wanted the blessings of the new life, but they also wanted the pleasures of the old life. They, like many people in the church, wanted the impossible, the best of both worlds. Note, again, my text verses, verses 14 and 15 of 2 Corinthians 6. Paul tells them, you cannot be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Paul is telling them they had to make a clean break with the world after they got saved. It's going to help somebody. If they were to love God, serve God, carry out his will in their life, you can't walk with God and not make some tough decisions about who you're going to run with and what you're going to do. <laughs> Paul's advice to them and for us today, it don't form any covenant relationship with unbelievers. It can take a variety of forms, covenant relationships in the church. Covenant relationships in business. Covenant relationship in marriage. Covenant relationship is all about relationship and intimacy. Koinonia. My wife and I have been in covenant relationship for almost 42 years. I took off my ring because of the fact that whenever I would get angry with her, I don't know what she does when she's mad at me, but uh, when I would be angry with her, and sometimes, you know, you, you start thinking weird stuff. I ain't taking this. I'm a man. I don't even, other women think I look all right. Why ain't I take this? Don't act like I'm talking to myself. I mean, your brain be thinking all this weird stuff. But then all of a sudden, I look at the ring. And I remember all the way back to September 14, 1978, when I said I will take her for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health. It was a covenant relationship. We have got to learn how to value our covenants and value our vows and keep our word even when it's difficult. Brothers and sisters, what relationship, Paul says, the darkness have the light? What relationship does Satan have to Christ? And what relationship does lawlessness have with righteousness? 
America is becoming lawless. Those who have vowed to obey and serve and protect us, some of them killing the innocent in what appears to be racially motivated crimes. And I want you to be clear as we try to balance out what's happening in the world today, we should take not a worldly view, we should take a Christian view. First of all, those police officers represent the few, not the many. See, you forget sometimes when a police officer has done you good. See, we cannot condemn the many for the actions of the few. And then this whole sense now of citizens taking the law into their own hands in retaliation vigilante justice is not justice because now you have involved and hurt people that had absolutely nothing to do with what happened in Baton Rouge and what happened in Minneapolis. Matter of fact, what we are starting to become is like ISIS and Al-Qaeda because that's their logic for how they kill people, men, women, boys, and girls. Well, America did this to us. Well, they hurt us over here. And so we don't care who dies. Everybody, nobody's innocent. We must watch ourselves as anger and rage begins to take charge and we lose our common sense and lose our sense of righteousness. Satan has blinded the minds and hearts of unbelievers. You are saved. You should see the events that happen in the world with open eyes, not blinded eyes, darkened and hardened by sin. Note in this same book, in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, verses 4 through 6, the Apostle Paul writes, and if our, he talks about our gospel, saying the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays, displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. His light has now shined in our hearts. That light gives us the light of the knowledge of God displayed in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, you are children of light. How many born again Holy Ghost filled people do I have on this church? Get those, look, get those hands on camera, because I want proof later. You say you're a child of light. You say you've been born again and make yourself accountable to no one. You say you are serving of Christ, and yet Christ is not your Lord or your master. No guilt when you do wrong. How is that a servant of Christ? See, I love it when saints confess their sins. See, a saint who says they did something wrong and not make an excuse for it owns that they are in the light and they did something that represents something in the dark and they want to do better. And brothers and sisters, as this message goes deeper and deeper, I want you to be clear. There are at least two consequences for forgetting who you are. Two consequences at least. First, and I want you to note the screen. Read it out loud. When you forget who you are, you go back to who you used to be. I thought I'd get a better response than that. Let's read it one more time. When you forget who you are, you go back to who you used to be. Note what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. And remember, these are saved folk, but the world is still pulling them. The world is still after them. So Paul has to tell the saints, he says, listen, don't you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? He didn't go into eternal security in the election. He's looking at their lifestyles. He said, don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Now, note this, nor men who have sex with men. Now, there are going to be people who won't come back here because that's in the Scripture, and I've said it. But I can't go by what the law says when the higher law says what's right and what's wrong. 
That's not to say we don't love everybody. We ought to love everybody, help everybody. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not just that. Note all the other things. We just go to homosexuality, and a, but he talks about idolaters and adulterers and the greedy and the drunkards. Some of y'all, if it's based on greed, you going to hell. You greedy. <laughs> I ain't never had nobody come in my office and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm greedy. I done had you come out and pray because you bankrupt because of your greed. Said none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, no verse 11. And that is what some of you were. Oh, Lord. And that is what you used to be. That was like the way you were before Jesus came in your life. But you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Tell your neighbor this old saying, I may not be what I want to be, but I thank God I'm not what I used to be. You see, brothers and sisters, as you can see, the threat to the church was not only unbelievers, but also people who were professing to be saved, but were either not saved or backsliding. Paul went so far to tell them to stop associating with them. The Bible is so hard to teach today because the scriptures like this. No, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. Paul says words I don't know no pastor can really tell people. He said, I'm talking about people in the church. The people in the church, I wrote you in another letter. Some scholars believe there's actually three letters to the church of Corinth. That's the Bible class discussion. But I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Then he said, not at all many of the people of, the, of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. In other words, if we are going to separate ourselves from sinners, we got to go to Mars. So that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, I'm writing to you that you shouldn't associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral, greedy, or a slanderer, or a drunkard, or a swindler. So they don't even eat with them. He's talking about people in the church. Can I teach today for a few more minutes? not dealing with the unbelievers anymore. He's talking about people in the church. And someone said, but pastor, why is he doing it like that? I'll tell you why. Satan would rather join the church than fight the church. <laughs> See, this stuff messes with people's head. Satan would rather join the church than fight the church. Because you see, when Satan fights the church, the church gets stronger. Think about it. When you know somebody's getting ready to attack you, you get ready and get your guard up because you're ready for the attack. And the scripture says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So the devil is going like, well, sometimes attacking don't work. So what I'm going to do is, as the scripture says, I'm going to transform myself into an angel of light and I'm going to put on my Sunday go to meeting clothes. I'm going to grab my Bible. I'm going to walk up in the church and say, Praise the Lord. Because you see, brothers and sisters, when Satan can get on the inside, he can do more damage. This is the reason the scripture says a house divided against itself shall not stand. If I had thought about it on an illustration, I would have brought it, but let's use your imagination. Uh, we were having ants at one of my house. I won't name which house. I've sold this since. Uh, but we were having a problem with ants. I went to the store. When I went to the store, they had all kind of different ways to kill the ants. But I noted on the box of one of them, it says, look, here's what you do. Uh, you put this out, and it's an ant bait. So the ant would go in, take the bait, but he took it back home. So you killed everybody by just a few taking the bait, the poison, back home. 
And so see, what Satan wants to do is get in your house. Because when he get in your house, a house divided against itself shall not stand. What you bring in the streets, you shouldn't be bringing into your house. That's straight from the Holy Ghost, but I don't, I didn't even, I would have had my aunt bait. I'd have been ready. But I'm not going to let that stop me from telling what the Holy Spirit is telling me to say. Go get some in between service. They'll have it for second service. <laughs> it's important to understand that we, even though we're born again, we, we're frail. We're not, we strive towards something that's not attainable in this earth. We are told to press toward the mark for the prize. We're told to press toward perfection, and yet it is impossible, even with the Holy Spirit, to attain it on earth. But the Bible doesn't tell us because it's impossible on earth not to keep pressing toward it. We're to keep trying. And anytime we fall short, then the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from sin. Let me move on quickly. The second consequence of forgetting who you are is this, and maybe most important. Read this out loud. When you forget who you are, you lose what you were becoming. I want someone to get this taking notes. So you, we have moved from the first one. When you forget who you are, you then go back to what you used to be. That's a question of identity. When you forget who you are and lose what you are becoming, that's a question of destiny. It's all right. I'm going to preach my message anyway. As I close, saints, don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. The love of the Father lavished on you for your sins. The love of the Father that put his son inside of you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Saints, don't forget you are the temple of the living God. Note 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. It says, we are the temple of the living God. The Greek word naos, which means that you are now a dwelling place of God himself. The God who created the universe lives in you. The almighty God lives in you. The omniscient God lives in you. The omnipresent God lives in you. The holy God lives in you. The righteous God lives in you. The God that fills all time and space lives in you. And the God that spoke the universe into existence lives in you and now has begun a new work of creation by recreating you to make you a new creation in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, God is molding and shaping your destiny. As we end this message, know Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you a message. I went down to the potter's house. I saw him working at the wheel. The pot he was shaping from the clay was what? Marred, disfigured. It was something wrong with it. The potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Isn't that amazing? Why didn't the potter just throw the marred clay away and start working on some new clay? God saw you in your mess, in your sins, in your wrong. He didn't quit on you. He didn't give up on you. He said, I'm going to recreate you as best as I can. Note here, this is a speed up version, fast, fast, fast forward of a potter shaping clay. I want you to know, as the potter shapes the clay, the potter already knows what he wants the clay to become. The clay must yield itself to the hand of the potter. You can't fight the potter who's trying to mold you and shape you. You can't fight him and then become what he would have you to be. The potter already knows what he wants the clay to turn out to be. So he keeps working with it with his hands like he keeps working with you and working with me. God knows from the beginning how he wants you to end up in the end. So God keeps working patiently and patiently. And so now we see this potter. He now has made the clay pot that he desired to make. He made it with the clay. 
the clay was usable in his hands. Give God some praise. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I got two quick clays up here, and then we're going to open the doors of the church. And since I do believe in gender, I have blue clay. That's brothers. Blue clay. Let the brothers say blue. blue. <laughs> and sisters, when you got these little six-month-old boys, don't be putting them in no pink. <laughs> and brother, some blue. Then we got this pinkish color look more like, I don't know what it is. My wife will tell me later. But brothers and sisters, have you ever thought about us as, as the altar workers begin to come forward that God is molding and shaping yeah. you? That you are a weak vessel of clay that God has gotten a hold of. And God now is molding you and shaping you into what he would have you to become. Know what Isaiah 43 and 17 comes. I hope someone's not saved. You can feel free to come down and be baptized. It's the shaping starts with repenting and being baptized. But the Bible said, this people have I formed for myself that they might show forth my praise. God has formed you to show forth for his praise. You were born again to be a worshiper. You were born again to be a praiser. You were born again to be more than a conqueror. You were born again not to, as you look at what's going on in the world, you and I are not victims. You and I are victors. You were born again to be a child of light and not a child of darkness. You were born again so you could declare that greater is he that is in you than anything that is going on in the world. You were born again so that God could show his power and might over evil. You were born again, ladies and gentlemen, that God might get glory and honor and praise. Thank you for joining us today and we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrated, contemporary and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and Lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org.